Hey you guys, it's Peter and welcome to my channel Peterisms where I tell stories of my life and little things that I have learned as I have grown into the person that I am today. And I read meditations and I was gonna try to figure out how to add that into my intro right there. Um, but yeah, I read meditations over here and then I kind of respond to uh, what I think of the reading. So today I have three meditations that I'm going to read from. Um, the Daily Book of Positive Quotations is kind of separate from the other two. I kind of just skimmed these, so I, I don't really know in, in depth what they say, but I do know that these two go together, and I thought it was really, really interesting when I pulled them out. So I'm going to read these two together, but I'm going to start with the Daily Book of Positive Quotations, because um, I like the meditation over here. So February 8th, it's about uh, cynicism. February 8th, avoiding cynicism, never be a cynic even a gentle one. Never help out a sneer, even at the devil. Vachelle Lindsay. Cynicism is the conversational tone of today's world. We think ourselves clever or hip if we can come up with a quick negative response to the world around us. We weren't born with this point of view. Children tend naturally to greet the world with openness and positivity, even if they've suffered a number of disappointments. One of the reasons we enjoy being around children is their fresh, upbeat, indefatigable approach to life. I will look on the bright side today, eschewing the snappy but cynical comments I often find so easy to make. Okay, this is a fantastic meditation for me. I grew up in an environment with a father who is extremely sarcastic and cynical, but all from like the point of view of humor. And, um, you know, if the people that know my dad say that my dad is one of the funniest people they've ever met in his entire life, I definitely get my sense of humor from my dad. Um, my mom also had a, a great sense of humor, but it was a corny sense of humor, you know? My dad's was constantly commenting and critiquing things that were going on in his life, often uh, times m myself and my stepmother. But it was funny growing up, even though at times it kind of hurt because I was like the pit of the joke. Um, you know, it, I think my dad's humor is one that you just get used to it over time. Well, what happened as I grew up is that became my sense of humor. And so, you know, I can be sitting at a dinner table with people and I can, you know, make some kind of biting, snappy kind of remark that I think is funny, you know, and um, it's, you know, sarcastic and cynical and whatever. But over time, what I have realized is that that can get a quick response or a quick joke. I don't necessarily feel good at the end of it, you know? And so, like, in the last year, I've really worked on not being that person, not being that, you know, making, uh, you know, like on my drama channel, if you watch my drama channel, I do do that a lot, right? But I think that that's the humor of that channel. But in my personal life, I have tried to not be as cynical or sarcastic. And you know what's interesting about it is that it's, it's like not all eyes are on me when I'm sitting at a dinner table with people, you know, friends of mine where we're all making jokes and whatever because I'm not making those jokes as much anymore. And so I'm kind of there just, you know, be, like saying my two cents and whatever. I do think that the humor that the majority of my friends and I share is a cynical, sarcastic sense of humor. I really, really do. Um, and I don't know that I think that there's necessarily anything wrong with that. But I also think that it doesn't have to always be my language. There's a time and a place for it, you know? I appreciate sarcastic, cynical humor. I really, really do. I think it's funny. Um, you know, especially I think when coming, you know, from the point of view of the gay community, when somebody will get in a good read or something, you know, or shade somebody, you know, in a funny way, even if it's me, um, and I'll be like, ooh, that was kind of funny, you know, I like that, that was hilarious. Um, but I think when it becomes repetitive over and over and over again, and that becomes the language that you talk, you know, I think then it becomes dangerous. Um, and I think it also comes across as being, at some points, um, aggressive, or dare I say, the, the B word. And, you know, it was interesting because um, we have a friend of ours that years and years and years ago, um, I said to her one time, I said, you know, I think that um, somewhere along the way you thought you, you thought it was cute to be like the mean girl or you know be the b word or whatever and it's not like that it's not fun to be around that you know and i love you but i just want you to know like i think that's why people are put off by that and um it's interesting because she's not that today at all and she's you know uh enjoyable to be around and um she's just you know full of love and compassion and i don't know what changed for her i don't know what happened but she's just not that person today um 
You know, I have friends of mine that are extremely sarcastic and cynical, but I don't know that I would trust them with my deepest feelings and whatnot. You know, my best friend, Tanya, that I talk about a lot, I mean, she's very sarcastic and cynical at times, too, from a point of view of humor. Um, but she also knows how to go in and out, you know, that it's not her, her constant language. And I think that there are times that... Um, any kind of sense of humor, you know, gets in the way of real language and real thought. So I think it's about learning, you know, timing and when to turn it on and when to turn it off. And, you know, or are you looking at the world through a critical eye? You know, I talked about that the other day when I was talking about, you know, Toni Morrison saying that when our kids would look, come in the, you know, the room that, you know, they're looking to see, do your eyes light up? Um, and that we often look at the, with the critical eye. Well, I think in the world, we often look with the critical eye. You know, I think we often look for the negative instead of the positive. Um, I was talking about this in a video that I did on my drama channel the other day, that I went into watching this video um, with a critical eye. I, I didn't go into it with an observant eye of being like, oh, I really like this, or I really like that. And so like, I rewound it and I went back and I started watching it again because I wanted to be really fair, you know, to the situation. And I think that it's important you know, I think that we are so like with athletics and, you know, or fashion or style or whatever, we are just prone in our society to see through the critical eye instead of seeing through a loving eye. And I, I think it's important, you know, to kind of like at times switch that up. I am so just like programmed to see things with a critical eye and I have to really work against that, you know, and um, I don't want to see the world as a cynic. I just don't. I want to be optimistic. I want to be idealistic. I want to be positive and hopeful about the world, you know? And it's interesting. I think that once you, you start training yourself to do that, or if you find yourself being extremely cynical, you go, okay, I'm not going to be right now. I'm going to change this for the rest of the day. I don't like how I'm feeling. I don't like the way that I'm looking at things. It's interesting, like, how quickly you can do that. And if you want to see the positive, you're going to see the positive. And if you want to see the negative, you're going to see the negative. And it's, the choice is really up to us. Um... So, you know, like, if you find yourself being around somebody that's negative all the time, that's because they choose to be seeing things that are negative. And maybe you are the person that sees things negative all the time. You know, I know for me, I was that. It was always the glass is half empty, never half full, you know? So I think it's a good meditation. I think it's a good thing to be aware of, you know? Um, and especially talking the other day about, like, needing validation and acceptance and wanting people to still, as adults, when we walk through the room, do their eyes light up. Well, when other people walk through the room, do our eyes light up? Do we see them through the critical eye or do we see them with a loving eye? I think it's a good, you know, discussion to have. Okay, the next two meditations I want to read. I read uh, the Nightlight one first. I skimmed it. And then I happened to just pick, pick up this uh, Meditations for Living in uh, uh, Balance. And they're, like, identical, same, identically the same, uh, well, that's, but anyway, they're almost the same meditation today. And I thought this is so funny because this is something that I've practiced a lot in the last year. So I'm going to read both of them and then I'm going to comment on it, which is something different than I usually do over here. Um, okay, so this is from the Nightlight book. February 8th, um, all miseries derive from not being able to sit quietly in a room alone. Blaise Pascal. When we are alone, what's the first thing we do? Do we turn on the radio, call a friend, invite someone over, make plans to go out, or turn on the television? How easy is it for us to be in silence for a period of time? Perhaps we grew up in homes filled with confusion and yelling and everyone talking at once. Silence may be uncomfortable for us. Perhaps we prefer to fill our rooms with noise so we don't feel alone. Whatever method we choose to drown out the sounds of silence, we are also drowning out another sound, the inner self. How can we possibly think, read, meditate, or write in a journal with noise bombarding us? To learn to sit comfortably alone in silence, we need to try it in, a sm in small steps. We can start with 5 minutes, then 10, then 15, then a half hour. By gently easing ourselves into quiet moments, we will allow our inner selves the time and space in which to grow. I can spend a short time alone in silence and listen to my inner self. Okay, I'm going to read from the Meditations for Living in Balance. February 8th, going into the silence. Um, there, and then in quotations it says the American Indians, favorite method for acquiring fresh wisdom and knowledge, and especially, uh, which today we would call Native Americans, but this is from the past. Uh, favorite method for acquiring fresh wisdom and knowledge, and especially uh, immediately needed information, was not to seek it vocally from some other Indian or even from printed words. 
On the contrary, each individually went into the silence. With his silence and then let the silence whisper to him whatever it was that he specifically needed to know. The silence had never once failed to cooperate with them in this manner. J. Allen Boone. There is such peace in going into the silence. The Quakers call it the inner light. The inner light. It is such an act of faith to believe that all the information we need can come through us and be available inside of us if we only have the willingness and the patience to learn how to wait with the silence. Waiting with the silence is an active place of quiet, a quiet place of action. Waiting with it is not passive, nor is it demanding. Moving into the silence requires that we shed all expectations while knowing that our answers are there. It is a place beyond thinking and reasoning, a place of silent, silent open anticipation. The information in that quiet place is the information and wisdom of the all that is, and it is available to us if we are available to it. We do not need meditation techniques and positions to enter the silence, only the desire to do so. Give yourself opportunities for going into the silence every day. You'll not regret it. Um, so when I first got sober, the whole idea of prayer and meditation was very confusing to me. Um, I didn't really have a firm idea of a higher power, so I didn't really know what or who I was praying to, and I felt like that was pointless. Um, I was told in early sobriety to, every night before I went to bed, say thank you, and every morning when I got up, say help. And those were the two prayers that I said in early sobriety, because I really couldn't say a whole lot more than that. Um, I then learned some other prayers that were very, very helpful for me, um, other than like the serenity prayer and things like that. And I grew up knowing the Lord's Prayer and all those very like religious-based prayers. Um, but a friend of mine said a prayer, and the prayer was, help me to want what I already have. And I still say that prayer today as a prayer for gratitude. Help me to want what I already have. So I slowly over time started understanding this concept of prayer, but I really didn't understand the, proce the process of meditation. And I got sober in 1994. And at that time, there was a lot of discussion about meditation and Zen Buddhism and things like that. And I thought, oh, wait, that's the meditation they're talking about. But at the time that, you know, 12-step programs came around, that was not like this trendy way of thinking. And what I know today is that what they meant by meditation at that time, when the text was written and when they would talk about it originally, was that they equaled meditation as deep thought, okay? Sitting in silence and having deep thought about what's going on in your life, whether that's gratitude or issues that are going on in your life, but just to sit for a few minutes in deep thought, how hard that is, especially for somebody like me who likes to talk a lot or have sounds and things like that. This is probably the first year of my life that I have really learned to practice that um, in full capacity. And I don't do it just, you know, sitting here in a chair and, you know, I, I don't do that well. But when I'm here alone in the house, um, you know, like I don't turn on the TV. I don't often have music playing unless I'm getting ready to like go do something and I want to kind of, you know, get excited. When I'm driving places, there are many times that I don't listen to anything in the car. I drive from one place to the next and I just kind of allow myself to think and process things that are going on for me. And it was funny, I have been doing it for a while and I didn't even realize it until my best friend got in the car one night and she said, um, are you just not listening to anything? This is probably like a year ago. And she was like, are you just not listening to anything? And I said, no, sometimes I like to drive around. Well, uh, well, first it started with me listening to classical music and opera because I found myself being able to just kind of float away in my head, you know, and think about other things. And so I was listening to a lot of classical music and opera, which I really like anyway. Um, I, I don't know it. I'm not an aficionado of that stuff. I just know I like some of it, you know? I do know I have a couple things. Like, I love Aaron Copeland's Appalachian Spring is probably one of my favorite pieces. Um, but there's, uh, we played it when I was in high school, when I was in orchestra in high school. But there's not, like, a whole lot of pieces that I know that, like, I listen to other than that that just bring me kind of, like, joy as far as classical and opera. But I do like it, and I feel like classical music and opera kind of helps me, like, get out of my head a little bit. So from there, I just kind of went to turning off the radio when I would get in the car and I would just listen to silence. And as you know, I listen to a lot of audiobooks and podcasts and radio and music and I love it. And I love to drive and dance and sing and all that. But there are times that I find that sometimes I have to uh, relocate my thinking, so to speak, or, uh, you know, kind of like figure out how to get back on track throughout the day or if my day has started off slow or if something happened. You know, I have to really, I want to really kind of think it through. And me driving in silence is a really good way to do that. Um, me kind of just like walking around the house cleaning and kind of thinking to myself is another way to do that. In the past, I always had to have the TV on. And in fact, 
when I would film videos throughout the day, I would find some movie that I loved on TV, like something stupid like Identity Thief, because I love, you know, all those, uh, what's her name? I can't think now. I was just talking about her last night. Um, but you know, she was in Tammy and oh, Bridesmaids. Uh, why can't I think of her name? Um, but anyway, I love all those movies. And so I would always find something dumb like that or some Alfred Hitchcock movie or some scary movie. And I put it on in the background like Halloween. I love all the Halloween movies from the franchise. And, um, I would put it on in the background and then like while I was filming video so it didn't pull my eye, I would pause it and then as soon as I was done filming and I was uploading a video, I would start it again, right? And um, so it's driving me crazy that I can't think of her name. Um, oh well, <laughs> it doesn't matter. I'll, I'm gonna look it up. As, as soon as I stop filming, it'll come to me. That's what always happens. So anyway, um, you know, but I, after, over time, what I started doing was I just turned the TV off. And now, I just don't have the TV on at all. And I don't listen to a lot of music throughout the day. I just don't, you know? And um, when I'm here, I'm usually here in silence. And it's kind of nice. You know, it's kind of nice to just, like, be in my head and be with my thoughts and things like that. So, I don't know. I think it's, uh, I think practicing silence is something that takes a while to get used to. Um, I used to hate it. I used to, like, walk in the door and I always had to turn on the TV. Like, right away, I would turn on the TV, but I don't feel that way anymore. Um, I'm comfortable in the silence. I'm comfortable. And I think what it really was was becoming comfortable with my own thoughts, you know? So you should practice it. If you have never tried it before, you should really, I know that sounds crazy like you've never practiced it before, but I mean, actually practice it. Not just be in silence, but actually like, you know, like come home and, re and say, I'm not going to turn the TV on or I'm not going to turn the music on and I'm just going to sit in silence for a little bit or try to like drive to work one morning and just think to yourself throughout what you want that day to be like. Like today I want to be positive. Today I want to be hopeful. It's going to be a great day. Like I talk a lot about doing positive affirmations on my vlog. You know, it's about that. It's about doing those positive affirmations as we go through our morning and maybe getting our day started that way and doing a gratitude list. It sometimes can just change the entire way that I look at a day, do that, you know? Anyway, try that and let me know what you think, or if you guys are already practicing silence, give me some tricks in the comment section below on how I can apply that even better to my life. And I love you guys, and I will see you tomorrow. Bye.